on, church, let's stand our feet today and worship the Lord. Come on, let's put our hands together. Let me think that I pray. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
your purposes, your will, Lord. May that be our desire. May that be our first desire. Because there's so many people that need to know you. On this side of it. morning, Revolution family. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. We're glad to see you today. It's a privilege to come to worship with you, lift up the, lift up our mighty God with you, and refresh and encourage each other. So it's, it's a privilege to do that. We're especially grateful for all of our first-time visitors today. Uh, we are glad you're here. We hope you plug in and become a part of this family. It's an awesome family. We get to serve our community, serve each other, and uh, most importantly, serve the Lord. But if you are a first-time visitor today, we have these Connect cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. Please fill that out and drop that in the uh, buckets as you leave the building today. And take a right as you exit the building today. We have a special gift for you. We'd like to uh, learn more about you and uh, share with you. Uh, how you might get plugged in and join our family here. We hope you do that. We also like to welcome our 27 correctional facilities online. Give them a hand clap of praise. We love you. We're glad you're there. We hope you come visit us. And uh, we mean that. And so uh, we're excited about that ministry as well. If you are online today uh, and you have your link for your online platform, go ahead and share that link, please. It makes a huge impact, even if it reaches one person that may not have heard otherwise. Uh, their life could be changed for that. So please share that link, and we appreciate our online ministry and our online campus, all that goes into that. It has an amazing impact that uh, we, we may not know for a long time, the, the massive impact that they have. So also today, we hope that you dedicate your life to Jesus. If you, if you have not done that already, if you decide to do that again, we welcome that as well. Make Jesus the Lord of your life, your Savior, and your life will never be the same, and it is an exciting journey. We want to walk that uh, path with you. So if you make that choice today, please, as you exit the building, take a left. We're going to have a special Bible there for you, and we'd like to meet you and hear your story and, again, connect with you as well to celebrate that decision that, you're, that you uh, made today. Also, we're having our basic training going on, our basic training led by Pastor David, and uh, that's going to be today. It's a little different today. It's not going to be in the pavilion. Uh, as you're facing the back of the church, uh, it's going to be on your left into one of the new buildings, portable buildings back there, uh, the one closest to the pavilion. That's where the basic training will be held today. You can join that anytime. It's a six-week course. You don't have to start at the beginning. So we encourage you to, uh, to come join. Pastor David has a great message there uh, on the basic faith elements and principles. So I encourage you to do that today. Also, we'd love... Uh, we, we appreciate and love those that are dedicated in their tithes and offering. It makes all this possible. Uh, I was talking to somebody between, the, between services. Uh, in fact, uh, Heidi and I were talking about the prom ministry, the, uh, the, the people that are ministered through that, the Second Chance Prom, the, the special needs event coming up. The prom there is incredible. Uh, that's going to be awesome. And, of course, we're already starting to plan. Uh, for helping hands this summer. So all of your tithe and offerings goes to support those ministries so we can get out in the community and have an impact. And it's unbelievable. It's awesome. Miracles are happening in those ministries. So we appreciate and uh, we are grateful for that. Let's go to the word and prayer uh, for our service today. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. We are so grateful here to come together to worship, to lift up your name, to hear the words that you have for us today. Open our hearts and minds and let us receive the message that you have for us today. It's going to change lives and, and hearts all over the, the country, excuse me, all over the world, Lord. We, we love you so much, Jesus. Bless Pastor Marquel as he comes and uh, just 
allows him, him to minister to us today. Anoint his words, Lord. We love you so much. We ask in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to Revolution. If this is your first Sunday with us, swing by the new attendees tent. We would love to meet you and give you a gift. If you're watching online this morning, let us know in the comments. I'm Daytona, and here's what's happening at Revolution. Mark your calendars for our 2024 Let's Glow Prom. This special event on April 26th is dedicated to allowing our individuals with disabilities a chance to glow. But we need your help. So head to the church app or website for further details. Enrollment for RCA Summer Kids Club is now open and filling up quickly. Head to our website or church app for more details and to register your child. On April 24th, Rev Youth will be hosting a joint service with multiple youth groups joining together. We'll have food, fun, worship, and a message brought by a special guest speaker. Make sure to mark it on your calendars and invite teenagers to join us here on April 24th at 6.30. Hey church family, if you have a heart for foster care and adoption, we've got a place for you and our fam ministry. Be on the lookout for more details coming soon. Hey friends, our eagerly awaited newborn nursery will be opening late April in room F1. It's gonna be fully equipped with bottle warmers, a fridge, some play mats, and a convenient nursing station. Our service will be live streamed so you'll never miss a moment. While our friendly nursery workers are ready to engage in insightful conversations as we embark on this journey to parenthood with you. We are so happy you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Good morning, Revolution Church. It is so good to see all your faces this morning. Um, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, those that joining us online, welcome them. Good morning to you. Those in the correctional facilities, good morning to you as well. Uh, before we get into the message today, I just want us to uh, just remember Pastor Pacer. He's traveling uh, this week. He went to Alabama. He went on a vacation. He, he said he needed a break from us. So, <laughs> nah, that's a joke. That's a joke. So, but he, he, he's in Alabama. He goes on a vacation, but he's still preaching today. He's preaching at Summer Church in Alabama. So, so uh, if you get a chance, go check that out online. I'm sure you'll be able to see his message today as well. Uh, it's amazing to see that God is still using him even on his vacation. Amen. Um, but also today we need to, uh, as, we, as we remember throughout the day, let's keep our prayers for Israel. Um, keep them in our hearts, please, uh, because of the things that are happening there and over there. Uh, and just that God has his will be done in that situation all across that nation. Amen. Um, but I wanted to start off in reading scripture today in Hosea. We're going to go to Hosea chapter 14. If you don't care, can you stand with me? I just, uh, as we go into this, give you a chance to, if you have your Bible, you can go there in Hosea chapter 14. It'll be on the screen as well. Um, but, and you can find this also in your notes if you have the church app as well. So, but Hosea chapter 14, it starts off with this. It says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God. For you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously. For we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. Nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our gods. For in you the fatherless finds mercy. I will hear their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the waves of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your spirit uses me today. 
I empty out myself to be a vessel for you, God. I pray that the words that you speak today touch the hearts and the ears of your church, Father. That whoever hears this message, that your word, your message clearly comes to them, Father. Wherever they are at in their lives, in their walk with you, no matter if they're lost or if they've been walking with you for 40, 50, 60 years, I pray that you have a divine appointment with your people today, God. Use this message to touch them. In the name of Jesus Christ, your church says, amen. You may be seated. I believe that today's message is for God's church today. That is for each and every one of us today. In fact, this, like it was reiterated to me this past Thursday night as I've already developed this message. I, 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 when I saw this sermon series revive, God began to deal with me on this message here. I've been working on it for almost three weeks now. And usually that's not me. I usually can't stick with one message after three weeks. I'm, I'm like, no, that's not relevant right now. That's not, no, no. Any, any writers, anybody that understands what I'm saying, like, like you're just like, ah, no, that's not, that's not good. Like, I need this or need that. But God has had this on my heart for the last three weeks. And I've been eagerly waiting to share this message. And so I believe that everyone sitting in this room today, those sitting at home online and those in the correctional facility, this is for you. And like I said, it was reiterated to me or, or strengthened to me uh, that this message was for today. When I was sitting in my men's group on Thursday night, I have a Bible study men's group that's, that's led by Troy. And so he'll never tell you. So we have a Bible study that meets on Thursday nights at 6 p.m. So he's very humble. But, but I'm sitting there and I'm talking with one of the guys that's sitting in the group. And we're sitting there across the table. And we're, we're reading through Revelation right now. We got through chapter 2, which is all like several of the letters to the church, and we're just reading that, and we're talking about the church and what it means to be the church and, and how these letters can pertain to almost, you can go into one church today, and you'll probably see every seven letter that God is, or that Jesus is dealing with, you can see an, each individual sitting in that room. But my, my buddy was sitting there, and he looks at me, and he says this to me. He says, I don't even like calling myself a Christian right now. Just because of the stigmatism that's with it. I'd rather call myself a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, he's not the first person that's ever expressed those thoughts to me. I've heard Christians and non-Christians alike ask me, they've asked me, Pastor Marquell, what is wrong with the church today? What is wrong with Christianity today? And, and they're asking me this because they can look inside the church and they see so much. They see marriages on the verge of divorce they see people dealing with, with pride and they see arguments and they see division and they see all these things inside the church. And they're like, that's, that's not the shining city on the hill that I've been told about. That, that's not what I've heard about Christianity or the church. It looks just like the world. And I'm sitting there thinking... What is wrong with the church? And also look at the beginning of this year. And, and, and at the new year, we had a sermon series called New Year, New Me. Who, who remembers that sermon series, right? New Year, New Me. And, and we were speaking on uh, Jacob, and we were talking about becoming, walking in the promises that God has for us. And we no longer have to worry about the bondage that we have. And, but Pastor Pacer mentioned this statistic in that sermon, in, in that first sermon in January of this year. He mentioned, he mentioned this statistic that the number one resolution for 2024 was to have better men, mental health. And I bet you that just as many Christians took that poll that came up with this stat as non-Christians. Christians. 
I'm sure there are several of us sitting in this room today and watching online right now that could say that they're Christian and they're dealing with depression. They're dealing with anxiety. They're dealing with fear. Not only that, they're dealing with marriages on the verge of divorce. They're dealing with sexual impurities. They're dealing with these bondages that continue to attack them and attack them. And they find themselves in a situation of no hope. And if I could be even bolder, I would say that the majority of those that are dealing with those things sitting inside of church today would come up to me and tell me, I am, I've, I've been saved. I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But, but if that's the case, then what is wrong with our church? But see, this message isn't about that. This message today is about that God has called you not to continue to dwell in that place. If I could title this message today, the sermon series is Revive. If I could title this message today, it is Revive Us God. Because He wants to revive us. I know that God has not called you to dwell there because I see scripture across the word of God like Isaiah 40, verse 31. It says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. If you know it, help me. They shall mount up on with eagles like eagles. They shall mount up with e wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That to me is not a state of despair. That to me is not a state of hopelessness. It's a state of freedom. It's a promise to say that whatever I put my hands to, as long as it's in the will of God, it will happen. It is a promise that says I will be able to rise up above the muck of this world. The darkness of this world, I'll be able to soar above the clouds of this world, the things that bring the rain into my life. I will be able to run and not grow weary. That's the state that God has called his church to. God wants to revive his people, which is my first point. God wants to revive his people. If you look at the word revive, you look in the Greek and you find that it's anathelo. Everybody say anathelo. Now, ana means again, and thelo means to flourish. So when God says that he wants to revive his people, he's saying, I want my people to flourish again. I want my people, I don't think you hear me, church. He says, I want you to flourish again. He doesn't want you to stay in that state of despair. When we started this message, we looked at Hosea chapter 14. And, and God in this chapter in Hosea 14 is actually giving a promise to Israel. He's promising that he will revive them, that he will return them to their former glory. That they will one day flourish again. But to understand chapter 14, you need to understand the whole book of Hosea. Now, Hosea was written or actually spoken and written down by the prophet named, of course, Hosea. You find it in the Old Testament. It's one of the minor prophets that's there. It's only 14 chapters long. And at this time that Hosea was called to be a prophet, you have Israel that was split into two kingdoms. You had the northern kingdom, which was Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was Judah. And you have Hosea was called to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. And Israel, at this time, had found themselves in a, this state of syncretism. Now, syncretism is when you start combining other religions together and other cultures together to start developing the principles that you stand on. And Israel found themselves going after other idols and other gods and other things. They had other cultures coming in, telling them and, and showing them different ways, and they were being drawn away from the way of God. 
They found themselves not going after the things of God. Can I be bold? Sometimes I believe the church sometimes is in that state of signatism. But Hosea was called, and right before he was called, God gives Hosea a challenge. In fact, he tells Hosea to go marry a harlot. And you find that in Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. So we're going right back to the beginning of Hosea. Chapter 1, verse 2, it says, When the Lord began to speak by Hosea, so when the Lord began to use Hosea to prophesy to his people, pretty much, it says, The Lord said to Hosea, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. God wanted Hosea to feel the same sting he was feeling from his people turning away from him. He wanted Hosea to to understand the suffering that he felt when his people would run away from him and going chasing after other things of the world instead of coming to him. Hosea had many times had to go and when his wife would run off and she would have to go and he would have to go and run and find her and buy her back. That's what God was doing with Israel. Israel kept going away from God and God continued to run after Israel to buy Israel back to him. Because he loved his people that much. What's amazing is is if you look at the name of Hosea, his name means salvation. And here God is using this man whose literal name means salvation to give a prophecy of destruction. So Israel is seeing destruction in front of them, but they're hearing the words of salvation. Now, it's not irony that that's happening. God was setting up a plan. If I have learned anything in life, walking with God, he's already got it all planned out. So God has this already planned out. He's already planned it out, and he's, he's using this man whose name is salvation, saying destruction's going to come, but chapter 14. Everybody say, but chapter 14. Chapter 14, God reminds them of the promise that he's going to return his people back to glory. God is reminding his people that you may see destruction in your life right now, but I am going to give you a way out. Hosea 14, 7 says this, those who dwell under his shadow shall return. His shadow is Israel. So those who are living in Israel, those who are going through the destruction right now, you shall return. They shall be revived like grain. They will flourish again like the grain of the lands. And grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. God loves his people so much that he continues to still provide them a way to salvation. He continues to provide them a way to be revived as a people. Some of us may be going through destruction right now, but I'm here today to tell you that God has a way to salvation. Some of us may be thinking, you, you, those biblical scholars that are in the room, they're like, that's great, that's Old Testament. I've, I've had this before, people have come up to that's Old Testament. What about the New Testament? What I love about God, God has it already all worked out. But just like God loves his people so much of Israel that he wants to revive them, God loves us so much that God wants to revive you. God wants to revive you. You may be stuck right now in a situation where you feel like there's no hope. You may be at home right now and you feel like there's no way out of this circumstance. You may be in a state of despair right now. And you're like, I can't, there's no way I can get through this. Can I be brutally honest with you? My wife says, uh, he gets me in trouble, so 
If I get in trouble, take it up to God. So, all right. We in the church are stuck in that situation, those that are stuck in that situation, and you already know God, and you have already been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you find yourself in that situation because we have become harlots ourselves. I think that deserves a bigger hand clap, right? Not because I like that truth, but because we're getting to the, the soul and the purpose of why we're there. Because we allow culture sometimes in the church to dictate to us what biblical principles we stand on. And the ones we decide to discard, even though we should never discard any of God's principles. Because that's not loving. Right? If it's in the word, we need to live it like the word. Many of us can't find joy because we're not walking with God daily. We're not praying to him. We're not reading our word. The song before, I will find my joy, my strength in who? In the Lord. We can't get ahead in life because we're trying to do it our way instead of following the lead of the Holy Spirit. Because that looks hard. What, what, you telling me I got to give up a career to do this for you, God? But, but what about where it says that a, a godly man will leave a good inheritance for his children's children? Well, guess what? As long as you follow God, all these things will be added to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. My marriage is on the verge of divorce. Some of us may be saying that I, we're, we're about to sign the paperwork right now. My marriage has never been rooted in God. Well, have you been rooted in God? Have we been rooted in God? We continue to look at other things outside of God. We look at other relationships. We look at our finances to tell us, are we being successful or not? We go and we find that self-help video that says, do these 10 things and you will find joy and peace in your life instead of going to the Word of God. Trust me, I've listened to those videos before, so. But we continue to look to these things instead of looking to the one that God sent to give us hope. And that is Jesus himself. Leads me to my third point. Remember, God wants to revive his people. God wants to revive you. But Jesus came to revive you. He is the hope. He is the thing that we need to be looking to no matter what situation we come across. I get a bad diagnosis from the doctor. Guess who I need to run to? I get some bad news from a family member. Guess who I need to be running to? I can't break a habit or an addiction. I need to be running to Jesus to break it for me. Jesus came to revive you. What I love about the Old Testament is it paints this picture of Jesus Christ before he even arrives to the earth, before he even arrives on the scene. And so you have this, this picture of Hosea in the Old Testament who is prophesying to Israel who is a harlot, and his name means salvation. If you go to the New Testament, we find a story of Jesus face to face with a harlot himself. And to find that story, you got to go to John chapter 4, verses 1 through 29. And in there, I'm going to set up the story before we jump into it, but in, in this story, you have Jesus, and he is, he is traveling, 
and he's going to Jerusalem. He's traveling, and he stops in, a, in Samaria, and he sits down at this well in a city of Sychar in Samaria. And he sits there, and this woman finally comes up, and she begins to draw water from the well. And Jesus speaks to her and says, give me some water. This woman at this moment when Jesus, uh, when Jesus speaks to her is taken aback because she's a Samaritan woman. And at this time, Samaritans were treated awful by the Jewish people. They treated them worse than scum. In fact, Jewish men would never be caught speaking to a Samaritan woman in public. And that's what she says. She's like, oh, who, whoa, you're, you're a Jewish man. How is it that you are asking me for water? How is it that you're talking to me? You're a Jewish man. I'm, I'm a Samaritan woman. And so we're going to jump in right there and what Jesus answers her with. And you go to John chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. It says this, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Oh, she didn't know who she was talking to. (laughs) Are you greater than our father Jacob who gives us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is here to say, I have something for you that will sustain you forever. Even past this life here on this earth. I have something for you that will be everlasting. See, that well in this story represents the things of this world. We keep going back to the things of this world to to draw from because it doesn't last. It doesn't sustain us. It doesn't keep us going. And so we keep going back to this well all the time, every day, every night, to get what we need to to sustain us. But Jesus is like, no. That's going to pass away one day. That's going to cease to exist. The things of this world, church, is going to cease to exist. Those voices that you have been listening to will cease to exist. Those principles that you've been trying to stand on, these worldly principles, will cease to exist. It is I who will will last forever. Now, this woman gets intrigued at this time. She's like, ooh, I want that water. She's like, give me that water. Where do I find that water? And Jesus tells her, go and and get your husband. Well, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He already knew what she had been doing. He already read her mail. What's crazy is, guess what? He's read our mail too. So you find yourself in John chapter 4, 17 through 18. And here you have this woman and she answers Jesus after he says, go get your husband. She says this, the woman answered and said, I have no husband, Jesus, or I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. The one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. Jesus is confronting her harlotry right there. She had been searching for peace and joy, and she's been searching for hope in all these other men. And she is finally standing face to face with the living embodiment of salvation. Of the things that she's been searching for, she is standing face to face with those And just like how Hosea's wife in Hosea represented Israel. Can I say, church, this woman represents the bride of Jesus. You, the church. What I love 
about it ends with this it, in her there, this this confrontation or this conversation ends with this in verse 25 it says Jesus, I, I know that the Messiah is coming. So she's saying, I know that the Messiah is coming. She's pretty much saying, I know hope is coming. I know salvation is coming. And this is what Jesus says in verse 26. He says, I am he. If you have been searching for hope and peace, and you've been searching for joy, and you've been searching for strength, if you've been searching for comfort, Jesus is here today standing face to face with you saying, I am he. I am the hope that you're looking for. I am the everlasting water that will sustain you for the rest of your breaths here on this earth. Church, do you believe that he is the one? We're going to wrap up with Galatians chapter 4, verse 9. It says this, But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak, biggerly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. Jesus is saying that why do you keep going back to the weak things, the things that continue to have you in bondage? Why do you keep going back to those things when I have already shown you I am he? Church, those sitting in this room, those at home in the correctional facilities, Jesus is here face to face with you. Don't waste this moment. Can we all stand as we go into an altar call? Jesus is saying to you right now, if you are dealing with depression, if you are dealing with anxiety, if you're dealing with suicidal thoughts, if you're dealing with those old bondages that have continued to come back, he is saying, quit turning back to them, turn to me. Quit going back to those things that have proven to you to destroy you. I want to allow you to flourish again. Jesus wants to revive you. Let's close our eyes for a second. Bow our heads. The prayer team, if you can come up to the altars. This message, when I'm thinking of who this is for, those that are in the church, those that are listening right now, I just have this sense like it's like this heaviness, this burden that is on your chest and you're just trying to grasp air. You're, you're, you feel like you're underwater. And you already know and understand what it feels to take fresh breaths of air. Because you've been there before, but for some reason, you're in this situation where you've turned to other things and you took your eyes off of Jesus and you're in this situation of no hope and you're just like, I need to breathe again. Jesus is here today to tell you you can breathe. It reminds me of a a situation of my son Cooper, my youngest. He's seven years old now. He was three at the time. And my wife was giving him a bath, and, and she was, took him out, and she started trimming his toenails. And, and Cooper, at the time, he dealt with sensory issues, especially with his feet. He would, you, he would not like to run around the house without socks. And everything he did, he didn't like anything touching his feet. And he had these sensory issues so bad that it would throw him into fits. And, and Cooper is sitting here. And she's trying to trim his toenails, and he goes into this fit. And he's uncontrollable, and my wife is trying to console him and try to, try to, to comfort him, and he's not, he's not accepting it, and he gets to the point that he goes into a breath-holding spell, and his brain pretty much shuts off and forgets to tell his body to breathe. 
And then that leads him into a seizure. And he starts convulsing, and then he begins to turn blue. And all of a sudden, his body goes limp. And my wife is freaking out. She's hollering for me to come up to the upstairs bathroom. I'm running up the stairs. She's like, I need you to get your phone. I need you to call the 911. I don't know what's going on. And, and I go get my phone. And she, at the meantime, is taking him from the bathroom to his bedroom. So she has more space. And, and thank God my wife is a registered nurse. And she begins to, to do CPR on our son at three years old. I don't know how she's keeping it all under control. Me, I'm freaking out on the inside. And I'm talking to them on the phone and telling them what's going on. And as she's doing CPR, he's, he's, it's like there's no life in his body. But then all of a sudden you hear this, <gasps> this breath, the peace that came over me at that moment. Jesus right now is looking at those in his church. He's looking at his people that know him, and he's saying, if that's you, you're take, trying to take a breath, take the breath that I have for you. He's calling his people right now. And as I pray, if that is you, I want you to move to these altars. If you're online at home, make an altar out of your bed. If you need to pull over, make an altar on the side of the road. If you're in the jail cells right now, surround your brothers and sisters and begin to pray. Say, God, give me a fresh breath. Revive us, God. Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the things that he has done for us. I thank you for the encounter that he is wanting to have right now, that face-to-face -face with your people, to say, I am the hope. I am the salvation. I am the one that will revive you. I am he. I pray that you begin to move on the hearts of your people. Allow no one to leave this place unchanged. Allow no one that hears this message to leave unchanged. Have an encounter with them. No matter where they are in life, if they have never known you before, Jesus, I pray that you reveal yourself to them, that they can lean on you, they can come to you, they can give their burdens to you, and you will set them free. I pray for those that are in the church and they found themselves in a situation where they hardened them themselves out and they've given over to idols and they've given over to the things of this world. I pray that you call them back right now and you say, just repent and come back to me. Move on your people. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. These altars are open. Do not leave this place unchanged.